Hello and welcome to this DW Business Special. I'm Chris Kober in Berlin. A 75-year-old principal under threat. That's what we will be talking about today. The principle that increased trade would foster peace and shared prosperity. And joining me for this conversation is Ralph Ossa. Since the beginning of the year, he's been the chief economist at the World Trade Organization. Welcome uh, to DW. Let's get started right away. Uh, when did economic ties and interdependence become a bad thing? Well, first of all, thank you very much uh, for having me. And it's a, it's a good question uh, you're asking. You know, when, when I think about the globalization crisis or what is sometimes uh, called the globalization crisis, I really separate uh, three different layers. And, you know, that, that kind of, uh, they all kind of started at, the, uh, at, at different times. I think the first layer is what you have been talking about. It's the change in the narrative. Um, and I think there we have really seen quite some uh, fundamental change. So people really do think quite differently about globalization now than they uh, than they used to be, mm -hmm. uh, than they used to. Um, you know, then the question is, what has this uh, change in the narrative done to um, uh, trade policies? Uh, and there, you know, it's, it's a little bit more recent, I think, that we really see some uh, action. And then the third question is, what have these trade policy changes done to economic outcomes? And this is really where we just now uh, mm -hmm. are beginning to see, uh, see some effects. And as a result, the World Trade Organization is warning of fragmentation of trade, that parts of the globalization could be reversed, including a much bigger and much more problematic focus on what individual countries perceive as their specific agenda. And that is something that the UN General Secretary finds quite concerning as well. Being ever closer to a great fracture in economic and financial systems and trade relations, one that threatens a single open internet with diverging strategies on technology and artificial intelligence and potentially clashing security frameworks. It is high time to renew multilateral institutions based on 21st century economic and political realities rooted in equity, solidarity, and universality, and anchored in the principles of the United Nations Charter and international law. UN General Secretary Antonio Guterres speaking there. Ralph, uh, also back to you. Now, the WTO has been saying that early signs of global trade fragmentation are appearing. Where exactly? Yeah, so we've uh, documented that in our World Trade Report, which came out uh, in September, and we also uh, renewed it uh, in the, uh, our trade forecast that came out uh, now in October. And, you know, I can give you a multiple uh, statistics, but one statistic that I find particularly striking is if you divide the world into two hypothetical uh, geopolitical blocks based mm. on voting patterns uh, or voting behavior in the United Nations uh, General Assembly. You see that since the um, start of the war in Ukraine, uh, trade uh, between these blocks is growing four to six percent uh, slower than trade within these hypothetical blocks. So you see some fast signs of uh, fragmentation. But it's also very important to keep in mind that we don't see any broad-based deglobalization yet. So these are really uh, only first signs mm. of this happening. Now, uh, because you mentioned that trend there, uh, what would it mean if this trend deepened regarding trade, so so-called friend shoring between trade blocks? Yeah, so I think you have to distinguish between the economic and, you know, perhaps the more broader effects. So the first thing that we have documented in our research is that the economic effects of, you know, this fragmentation would be quite quite severe. So in the worst case scenario of the world really splitting into two uh, uh, geopolitical uh, blocks, we estimate that on average real incomes would fall by 5% uh, with the effects much higher on some developing countries. But what's even more important to me is that we are convinced and we have argued in detail in our World Trade Report that if you want to build a more uh, secure, a more inclusive and a more sustainable world, you also need to embrace international trade. So, for example, it's not just about the economic gains, but it's also about the environmental gains. If we want to make progress on sustainability, we also mm. need to embrace international trade. You mentioned the benefits there of, of global trade, of international trade. Um, but why is it that this narrative that you uh, mentioned earlier actually has changed, mm -hmm. that people perceive global trade as something that is threatening? 
Well, I mean, I think, you know, I understand where people are coming from. We had a multitude of crises. Uh, we had, um, you know, major shifts in, uh, you know, the way uh, in, in the balance of economic power. I mean, think about it, you know, you had the, you had the rise of China, which, um, you know, of course, made life difficult for some uh, workers in industrialized countries, uh, also made life difficult uh, for some developing countries that were also trying to export. Uh, we also had the COVID pandemic, which initially at least, you know, uh, showed to us how important it is to have resilient supply chains and how vulnerable some of these links um, uh, also can be. And when you think about the environment, of course, m most people think, you know, trade is the same as transportation, transportation is the same as emissions, uh, because they think of dirty trucks and planes and uh, ships and so on. So I think it's understandable that people come to this uh, conclusion. Mm -hmm. It's just a wrong conclusion. And I'd be happy to talk about that. Uh, let's take a look at the, at the bigger picture here. Let's uh, uh, see how global trade uh, has been faring most recently. World trade slowed abruptly in the fourth quarter of last year, down more than 6.5% from 2021. Estimates for this year's trade growth stand at barely 1%. And trade growth is expected to pick up uh, to 3.3% next year. Uh, Ralph, also back to you. Put those figures into perspective for us. Are we just going through a temporary dip here, or what's going on? Yeah, so so you're right. We have just today um, revised our trade forecast down from uh, our initial estimation uh, estimate. That's for 2023, and that's for the volume of world merchandise trade, I should say. So we initially in April predicted 1.7% for this year. Now we're down to 0.8%. Uh, for next year, we expect it to pick up again, as you mentioned, to 3.3%. Now, um, you know, really, the way I see uh, this year, to be honest, I, I really see it as a uh, as a uh, as a uh, as a temporary uh, dip. So I wouldn't uh, ring the alarm uh, yet that mm. we are seeing the beginning of deglobalization because what, what what's what's happening? Trade is really um, quite a bit more cyclical than uh, GDP. So if you have a reduction in GDP, trade falls by a little bit more. And I think what we're going to see now is this uh, kind of reverting back to the regular trend. But but if we are in the environment that we're in, uh, that that we talked about in the beginning, yes. I mean, what makes you so optimistic that global trade will bounce back next year? Well, yeah, it's a it's it's a good question. I mean, of course, we see you know trades. Uh, we see risks on the downside. We also see risks on the upside. I mean, you, I mean, fragmentation is of course, and, and geopolitics is of course one important issue. But another important mm -hmm. issue is just or another important driver of international trade is just the uh, general macroeconomic conditions and. You know, for example, if we see a soft landing now, if we see inflation coming down, and central banks. Uh, would be able to reduce their interest rates uh, faster than we expect. You could also uh, imagine that the world economy is faring better. I think the important thing in a way is we, we, we don't really need to focus so much on the overall trade volume. It's really in the trade shares where we see, uh, mm. see some difference. So I, I'll give you another statistic. Last year in 2022, trade between China and the United States was at a um, record high. Yet when you look at uh, that bilateral trade, you do see important changes in the composition of trade. Fragmentation seems to not only be fueled by war, but also in the attempt to address rising prices and climate change. How do you view the $370 billion Inflation Reduction Act in the United States, with which companies in the green energy sector get incentivized to set up shop in the U.S.? Well, I won't be able to comment specifically, uh, uh, you know, on the Inflation Reduction Act because, you know, I can't comment on policies of individual member countries, but I can tell you a little bit, I'll give you some perspective about the kind of subsidy or emerging subsidy race that we are seeing. It's not just the United States, you know, other countries are imposing subsidies uh, also uh, on these goods. And I mean, the first thing I would say, it's good that uh, governments around the world are now, um, you know, taking climate change uh, seriously and, you know, are, are putting some policies in place that, uh, you know, are also pursuing uh, this objective. At the same time, uh, I would also say it's it's, it's, it's very important um, that we don't end up in a subsidies uh, race that is really hmm. uh, damaging uh, everyone and, and, and even worse, leading to trade tensions because right. the, the problem is that we really need trade uh, for sustainability. So we, 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 we need to make sure we don't uh, uh, kind of break that.
But Ralph, isn't that isn't that what we're precisely in with the EU responding uh, to this Inflation Reduction Act by easing limits on subsidies member states can grant companies? I mean, that looks like a massive paradigm shift here. I mean, I, I will um, uh, I will admit, you know, of course, uh, you know, we 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 do see uh, uh, we do see, you know. Uh, you know, governments around the world now imposing uh, imposing higher subsidies, and I'm also concerned that this uh, you know subsidy race might get uh, out of control. I think for us, uh, as the WTO, I mean, it's the, the you know are the subsidies as such a good thing? I mean, that's one question you can ask yourself. But but for us, what's almost more important is that you know our members are really perceived uh, and and also do uh, stick to the rules because if. Um, you know, at the end of the day, there's a perception, and even if it's not true, if there's a perception that some members don't play by our rules, then, you know, you might have a broader collateral damage on the rules-based trading system. And that's really, I think, what we need to avoid. Now, uh, I mentioned the EU and the United States here before. Obviously, uh, Europe is not only trading with America. China has become a massive trade partner uh, for the EU as a bloc and for individual countries. Now, the European Commission has unveiled a list of four sensitive technology areas to de-risk its relationship with China and other authoritarian states. Cutting-edge microchips, AI-powered systems, quantum computing, and genetic engineering will be put under the microscope to determine whether their exports and imports represent a danger to the security of the European Union as a whole. Now, the EU has become wary of its dependence on partners like Russia and China ever since the COVID-19 pandemic disrupted supply chains and the war in Ukraine led to an energy crisis. Ralph, also, back to you. Uh, do you think it's right what Brussels is doing here? I mean, you know, again, I can't, you know, comment on an individual policies of, of our members. But, you know, what I what I, what I can say is that, um, you know, I, first I can understand that, uh, you know, give, given these supply disruptions that, that we've seen, that countries are increasingly concerned about supply chain security. Mm. It's just important that we draw the right uh, lessons from it. And, and, and you, know, uh, you know, I'm not even disputing that there might be uh, over dependence uh, on some country in the current uh, configuration. We have some work, for example, where we um, uh, also show that um, the the fraction of um, um, we call them bottleneck products or so products that are both uh, important in demand and supplied by very few countries. That share has risen. It's uh, now at almost 20 percent. So. So I recognize, you know, that there are these issues of over-dependence. The question, though, is what are we going to do about it? And what we would advocate uh, as the solution is really what we call re-globalization. So rather than deglobalization, French shoring, home shoring, just make sure that you diversify your supply chains. And then, you know, it can even become an opportunity for countries that have so far been uh, marginalized uh, in international trade, for example, in Africa. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's talk a bit about China here, uh, which has been a member of the World Trade Organization since uh, 2001. Uh, but trade and interdependence have not led to a more democratic and open China. Doesn't that completely refute the argument that trade is a proper tool to make the world a more understanding and open place? Well, I don't think, um, uh, you know... You know, it, it's the, uh, you know, it, it was the purpose or is the purpose of, of, of the WTO to, um, you know, create a, a Wandel durch Handel, as we say so nicely in, uh, in German. Um, but I think you also have to recognize what, um, you know, WTO membership and, and trade more broadly did for the uh, did for China and also for the developing world. I mean, literally, you saw hundreds of millions of people uh, mm. being lifted out of poverty. You saw uh, this extreme. I mean, this is an uh, unprecedented economic miracle giving hope to developing countries around the world that they are not uh, necessarily stuck in a poverty trap and that they can find a way out of it uh, also through trade. And I think, you know, um, with, with all, I mean, I understand, you know, these these concerns that, that you're mentioning, and I don't want to minimize them. But at the same time, I think you also have to recognize uh, uh, the power uh, of trade uh, in that particular context. And I don't think anybody is disputing uh, that China has uh, done a remarkable job when it comes to, to lifting uh, many people out of poverty, as you say there. But then again, uh, when you mention uh, China being ex an example, uh, many countries 
look towards China now, see the economic success, and see under which sort of mm -hmm. political circumstances uh, this economic success has been happening? Sure. I mean, that, that that may be. And, you know, that is that is that is not really for me to judge. I think for me as uh, or for us as the World Trade Organization, I think mm. the, the, the more important um, aspect is to really emphasize how trade has been an important uh, engine of, uh, of economic development and, and how, how that can how it can continue to be that engine in the right. future. And let me let me just say something. Yeah, I mean, China. Um, you know, this was kind of an export-led industrialization. So, if you will, an older model of uh, of growth that Japan had done before, that you know Germany had done before, um, um, with different political systems. So, I don't think it depends at all on what kind of political system you have. But now, what we see is we see a rise in digital trade. We see a rise in digitally delivered uh, uh, services. So, there may even be an opportunity for some developing countries to leapfrog this whole industrialization phase and become a service-based uh, exporting economy right away. China has been at the forefront of several political and economic initiatives uh, in the region. How do you view the future of free trade agreements, which in Europe, for example, have been viewed with a lot of skepticism among the public in the past? I mean, this, uh, you know, obviously, you know, free trade agreements are, um, are perfect, you know, is, is something that, that countries can pursue uh, under under our rules, uh, under certain conditions. You know, of course, for me, the uh, primary, um, you know, path for trade integration is the multilateral path, particularly in a world of uh, uh, of, of geopolitical tensions, as you mentioned. Now, you know, you you, you were talking about uh, the, the controversies surrounding uh, free trade agreements or preferential trade agreements uh, in, in Europe, in particular in the past. And there I will say, I mean, if you if you uh, listen to people, what they're actually concerned about is not so much trade, it's all the other things that, you know, come uh, with these agreements, be it uh, investor protection, be it regulatory cooperation. Um, so it's really about non-trade issues, I would say, uh, mostly, or at least about what we call deep integration issues, so something that goes beyond simple um, tariff policy. Right, but aren't these issues just part of the framework in order to do trade? I mean, aren't they a prerequisite? Uh, if, if these rules wouldn't be there, then trade or investment might not even happen. Absolutely, but I think you know what we need to recognize, and I think we also do recognize, at least uh, at least here, is that the economics uh, becomes a little bit more complicated. You know, if you have uh, tariffs, um, if you have a tariff and I have a tariff, then if we both cut the tariff, uh, then this is going to be good for me and you. It's pretty straightforward because a tariff is nothing more than a trade barrier. But if I have one set of regulations uh, to protect my uh, consumers and you have another set of regulations, then mm. that regulatory difference. Is, is a trade barrier, but it might also just be driven by, you know, just different regulatory objectives that uh, you have and I have. So uh, I think, you know, discussing trade liberalization, so to speak, in that context just becomes more more complex. And we need to recognize that it's not just about, uh, it's not just a simple liberalization anymore that we can mm -hmm. call for. We really need to sit down and discuss the uh, issues, which makes it so hard, but also uh, important. I agree with you. It's the future of trade policy in many ways. Now, Ralph, many view the World Trade Organization as somewhat of a paper tiger. I'm sure you're going to disagree with that assessment, of course. But in what way does the organization have to change to make it more effective? Yeah, so as you predicted, I'm going to strongly disagree because I do think we um, have achieved quite a bit on the multilateral front. If you think about the outcomes of our last ministerial conference, for example, we were able to curb uh, harmful uh, fishery subsidies, which contribute to the overfishing of our oceans. So I think a really uh, significant achievement in terms of, you know, plurilateral uh, outcomes. We also have agreements on services, on investments, on e-commerce. Mm -hmm. So there's really um, a lot of action here. I mean, having said this, you know, I'm not... Uh, denying that we, we need a change and that we need to improve. And I think our members are working on it. But in what way? How, how does the organization need to change? Well, I mean, I can tell you just from uh, economic analysis, uh, you know, I can tell you what some of the remaining frictions are in international trade. We still have uh, high trade costs uh, that are faced uh, by developing countries. We still have high trade costs in agriculture. We still have high trade costs in services. So we need progress, uh, for example, on uh, our services uh, negotiations. We need progress on our agricultural negotiations, for example. Uh, but there's, of course, uh, many other uh, issues that come to mind.
Ralph Ossa, thank you very much for your thoughts. Ralph Ossa is the chief economist at the World Trade Organization. And thanks to thank you, you for watching. Be sure to tell us what you think in the comments section and check out more of our stuff in the business section of the DW News YouTube channel. I'm Chris Kober in Berlin. Take care and see you soon.